So this morning, yeah, well, again, we're going to pick up our notes in verse 10, okay? But we're going to back up. Um, we're just going to back up one verse to verse 9, and we'll read through the end of chapter 4 through verse 16, go through all of those notes, and then, um, Lord willing, we may have time to even get into uh, the first portion of chapter Five. So, um, having said that, everybody have a book that wants a book to follow along. Okay, excellent. Let me open with a word of prayer, and then we will start reading there in verse 9. Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you for another Lord's Day. To come together in fellowship, to come together in love of, and worship of you. Lord, of care and fellowship with each other supporting one another as we live this life, this Christian life, for you. Lord, we thank you that we have such freedom, Lord, literally to leave our homes, to come here, to bring our Bibles, Lord, to sit together, to talk about the things of God, to read the Word, and not be persecuted, not to be shut down by outside forces or authorities, Lord. We thank you for that freedom that we have. Lord, we ask that you would watch over us this morning, that you would guide us, that you would give us discernment, you would give us wisdom, you would give us sharp minds as we walk through, Lord, a, a little bit more difficult portion of the scriptures in the fact that 2,000 years later, Lord, we're Gentiles and we're reading this uh, this letter written to the church, yes, but Lord, having so much from the Old Testament. So we ask, Lord, that you would be able to have in our minds the understanding of why this author is quoting from the book of Psalms and quoting from the book of Deuteronomy, teaching these folks, Lord, that we would learn these lessons to literally be in their shoes so we can read this correctly. So, Lord, we ask that, again, you would... Um, just give us eyes that see and ears that hear. And we do all of this, Lord, for the glory of your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Verse 9 of chapter 4. As you know, the author here of whom I teach is the Apostle Paul. And we're going to get into another, what I believe is a good, strong proof text that this is Paul writing this letter to these Hebrew believers. Um, he has walked us through the fact that Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of Man, the Messiah, is greater than angels, correcting that bad doctrine that has slipped into the early church. That He is sovereign over creation. That He is uh, higher than even Moses. That He is truly the high priest. He is the king. And we're going to see here throughout the rest of chapter 4 and getting into chapter 5, that Jesus, this high priest, is the ultimate high priest. That He truly is God. That He truly is man. That He is the mediator for His people with the Father. That He is the sin bearer. That He is our priest. That He continues that ministry of mediation for us. He secures our salvation. He is the one that secured even the holiness that we possess that He has gifted to us, okay? And here in verse 9, it continues this proof that the author is using in Psalm 95 that uh, this teaching that there is going to be a future rest, a future Sabbath rest, if you will, again showing the fact that not everything was fulfilled when Moses and Joshua is, are leading the Israelites into the promised land. That is not the close. That is not the fulfillment of the Old Testament. That we find the Old Testament fulfillment actually in the Messiah and these promises of this future Sabbath rest. And again, if you make note on there on verse 9, that future Sabbath rest being the millennial kingdom or the messianic kingdom, as taught in the Revelation chapter 20, 21, and 22, the millennial kingdom, that true earthly reign of Jesus for a thousand years, where the Old Testament prophecies are truly earthly, physically, perfectly fulfilled, and then they will have a future fulfillment even past the millennial kingdom into the new heavens and new earth, again as described 
in the book of Revelation. Okay, So that's what verse 9 there, picking up there, where it says, So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Verse 10, For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works, as God did from his. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest, so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to, to help in time of need. Okay, let's walk through this here. So we have this understanding. You believers, especially you Hebrew believers or Hebrew folks that are in and amongst the church and they aren't quite believers yet, okay, know that there is a Sabbath rest for the people of God in the future. We know this. All right? And then it goes not only this millennial reign, this new heavens and new earth rest, but here in verse 10, it is also for the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. Okay, this is a, this is a very Jewish sentence here. Okay, uh, again, I argue Paul, but the author here, um, the way he is putting this is if you have salvation in Christ, okay, you have salvation in Christ. You have entered at least into this first phase of rest. You have salvation in Christ. You know that there is no wrath that is going to come upon you because the wrath of God for your sins, for my sins as believers, were placed upon the Son of God on the cross. Okay? You have entered at least into this first phase of rest. And I say a first phase because you possess salvation now as a believer in Jesus. You are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. And yet, from day to day, in this form, though we are saved, unfortunately, we still do what? We still sin. Okay. In this phase, we have this sin that we are daily doing battle against. <laughs> it will not always be that way. In the next phase, if you will, is, this is our, our uh, rapture, or if you will, this resurrection, we are given what type of bodies? Glorified, sinless bodies. No longer sinning physically or actively sinning, no longer sinning in our minds. If you will, maybe an understanding of this, that's a different or a second phase of your salvation. Okay? You're going to have a different type of existence. Okay, so he says, for the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. Now the author is really speaking to those Jewish people in this audience, reading this letter in these churches. Because by default, what does the Jew think about salvation? By grace or by works? By works, okay? So they, they have been burdened, even in this synagogue and temple teaching structure that they would understand. It was, I'm a descendant of Abraham, but I must keep the law to keep this salvation, to earn this salvation. Even though I'm of the chosen nation, I still have to do something. i got to work for something. Here the author is saying, no, if you are in Christ, you are having this salvation, you are have union with the Messiah who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his what? Works. There's no, there is no earning of salvation. Okay? And also it's the understanding even indwelt by the Holy Spirit 
Can you and I perfectly keep the law? No, we break it on a daily basis. Okay, So he's wanting them to understand you've rested from your works because you're actually not relying on your works. You're trusting your salvation in the works of who? Christ Jesus the Messiah. He is the one that perfectly fulfilled the law for his people on their behalf. Again, we talked about this last week or the week before. There is a reason why the Messiah did not just come down for a weekend. Right? He comes down, he dies on Friday, he's buried, he's in the tomb Saturday, raised on Sunday, done. That is not the plan of redemption that God has put in place. He goes and he sends his son and he lives under the law for those 30 some odd years perfectly. Because he follows the law perfectly on whose behalf? Our behalf. So we are credited with his righteousness. We are credited with the life of the Messiah. Our salvation is wrapped up more than in just the death and resurrection of Jesus, but also his life. Okay? So for the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. Again, also as God did from his, going back to Genesis 2. And by the seventh day, God completed His work which He had done, and He rested on the seventh day from all the work which He had done. Genesis 2, verse 2. Alright? Therefore, we see that word, therefore, you cannot separate what you're about to learn from what you were just taught. Okay? So therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall. Through following the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So therefore let us be diligent to enter that rest. You need to be diligent. You need to understand what salvation is do you possess it be diligent think about it okay am i trusting in myself for salvation am i trusting in something outside of christ for my salvation so you are being diligent to enter that rest you are thinking about it you are pondering it you are comparing what your beliefs your doctrine your theology is is it lining up with what the scriptures have been telling me. Okay? So we're let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall through through the following the same example of disobedience. Again, the author takes us back to the fact that Israel was under slavery in Egypt. They are led out by God through his servant Moses. Okay? They see all the signs and wonders. They know Yahweh is the one true God. And yet, those who are taken out of Egypt, are they all true believers? No, they aren't. By example taught in the Old Testament and here undergirded in Hebrews, many of them fell in the desert. And the author is going to get into that here in a little bit. Okay, So again, he brings that to the church age, that just because you are in and amongst the church, just because you're in and amongst other Christians... That the, you're not a Christian by osmosis. You're not a Christian by association. So you have to be diligent to understand, am I a real believer, trusting only in the Messiah's work and salvation in Him, not in myself, and not in my association with believers? Okay? okay. Yes, question. It's, well, it just sounds similar to what... Paul says in Corinthians about examine yourself mm -hmm. to see whether you are. Examine yourself. yourself. Absolutely. And even uh, in 1 Peter, where Peter says, make sure of your calling. Of, of He says even election. Make sure that you understand the salvation that God has given you. Not that you're resting on your own works. Okay? Which, again, by default, book of Hebrews, the Hebrews would have said, yeah, but I really want to do something. Right? I want to feel like I've earned it. Okay? So they struggled with this. But look at verse 12. Look what the author drives us to as we're being diligent, as we're examining ourselves, 
as we're examining our salvation, okay, look what he drives us to in verse 12. It says, For the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. All right, so the Christian. The Christian that is a true believer, and they want to make sure of their salvation, and they want to examine how they're living their lives, and you want to examine, am I living a life that is pleasing to the Lord? Okay? What should you do? Right. You go to the Word of God. You compare your life, your thoughts, your beliefs, your teachings, what you say, what you think, you believe, all of that wrapped up, and you compare it not to other people, right? Not to what a pastor says or not what somebody says on the radio, what somebody says on TV. What do you take it to? The Word of God. Because look, it says, for the Word of God is what? Living. It is living. Okay? It is living and active. How can that be? How can words on a page, how can the Scriptures itself be living and active? Now, for the believer, it is living and active because you have who guiding you and giving you wisdom and understanding of the Word. Who is doing that? The Holy Spirit. Do lost people have the ability to do this? They do not. You, they, they, you have lost people that read the Scriptures as documents. They may see it as religious books and things like that. They read it. They may understand the words and the definitions and things like that, but they don't understand it. They don't own it. They don't possess it the way a believer does. It's impossible, according to 1 Corinthians 2.14. The lost person cannot understand these things, but the believer can. Not because of our own intelligence, not because of our own wisdom, but because this Word of God is living and active. And this is drawn to us by the Holy Spirit. Okay, So for the Word of God is living and active, Notice, sharper than any two-edged sword. Okay? That is make, M-A-C-H-E. Make. All right? And this is an executioner's sword, is what he's talking about. This is an executioner's sword. This is the sword used by one that is very much associated with life and death. This is serious work. This is serious power. Okay? Just as this executioner's sword. Okay? Yes, two edged sword. Yes, make. Okay? Uh, very, it, sooner or later it gets anglicized where we get into, like, um, uh, how do you want to say it? Dagger, machete. The shorter sword, but it's an executioner's sword used, uh, in essence, to kill quickly. Okay? So, so it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And just as these are matters of life and death, the Word of God speaks to this. And it even to the point where it says, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It is so precise. Okay? It is so perfectly crafted. It is without error. It is living and active. This soul and spirit, okay? The Word of God can even judge. For I'll give you an example of the soul and spirit and the intentions and thoughts of the heart. Can a believer do ministry with the wrong heart attitude compared to a believer doing ministry with the right heart attitude? Okay? Can that Christian, can he fool or she fool other Christians by hiding that attitude? Yeah, we do it all the time. We're all guilty of that, right? But guess who you're not fooling? The Lord God. Okay? So again, you, you, can, you can do ministry, and you're, maybe you're doing it out of, uh, 
I don't know, uh, because it's expected or peer pressure, or, but you have this wrong heart attitude, okay? So this division of soul and spirit, you can do this ministry, you can have the right heart attitude, and you know you will receive rewards for it. You can do ministry with this wrong heart attitude, and you will not receive rewards for that. All of it because you are comparing your life, your actions, your thoughts to the Word of God. Not to other people, not to things that you're hearing on the outside, but to the Word of God. And so it pierces. And you know this. This is true. I guarantee you, if you've been a Christian for longer than five minutes, if you are good and you are diligent and you are prayerful before the Lord and you read the Scripture, it does not take very long for you to start getting convicted of things you've even thought about or done. Right? Okay? It pierces. Many times we rationalize things. We gloss over things. Of, well, I mean, I know I do this or say this, but I mean, that per that's a Christian too, and they, they act the same way, so I mean, it's okay. I mean, the Word of God does not do that. Okay? It is sharp, and it separates. This is wrong. This is not pleasing to the Lord. This is pleasing to the Lord. And it brings conviction. Okay? That is only in the life of a believer. That does not happen in the life of an unbeliever. Okay? For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge not just the heart, but it, look at it. It says judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart uh, or of your inner being. Okay? Of your inner being. Um, the, the, this would be the, <laughs> in Jewish terms, this would be the bowels of you, the very center of you. Uh, in our culture, we talk about, you know, what is his heart intention? They would say the kidneys, what is his, what is the intentions of his bowels is what he is saying here, okay? To what is your innermost being, your thoughts and intentions, the Word of God speaks to that, and it can divide that. It will get rid of that rationalization. It will get rid of that glossing over, and it will bring conviction through the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Notice there in verse 13. And there is no creature hidden from His sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. Don't miss this. Don't want, do not miss this. Look how connected the Word of God is where it says, and there is no creature hidden from His sight. The author directly goes from the Word of God directly to God Himself. Okay? Uh, John does this in his Gospel and also in his letters. Okay? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the, and the Word what? was God, okay? So there's this divine uh, connection, if you will, of the written Word, the Scriptures, the oracles of God, as it is called, with God Himself. And it's so blended and so perfect that we go from 12, right? Verse 12, talking about the Word of God. Then we go directly to God in verse 13. There is no creature hidden from His sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. That would include actions, thoughts, sinful thoughts, holy thoughts, deeds that we are doing in this life by all creatures. They are all seen and they are all laid bare. This again speaks to the doctrine of God's omniscience. Okay, he is omnipotent. He is omniscient. He's omnipresent. He is present everywhere. He knows all things. He sees all things. Okay, And in this, um, this is a really cool thing. In the doctrine of omniscience, not only does he see all things and know all things, because he is God, he doesn't have to think. He possesses all knowledge and all possible knowledge all at the same time without having to remember or recall or memorize something. He has all knowledge of all time, all there, period. Okay? So there's no creature hidden from His sight. All things are open, laid bare to the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. 
therefore, so don't, don't separate anything. Keep this line of thought going. So therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Okay, because that is true, because the Word of God is living and active, because there is nothing hidden from God the Father, there's nothing hidden from God the Son or Holy Spirit, all things are open, therefore... We have this great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. With this verse, I'm going to start backwards. Let us hold fast our confession. That is both singular and as a group at the same time. If you are a Christian, your salvation is particular to you, correct? Right? Somebody else can't get you saved, and somebody else that's a Christian, they don't get to pass on their salvation to you. It's not inherited, okay? Your salvation is directly between you and the Lord. All right? So you confess Jesus as Lord. That is your confession. At the same time, it is also true, when you group together believers into a local body, a church, we are what? We are all confessing the same Lord God. The Jesus that saved me is the Jesus that saved you. Does that make sense? Okay. We have both a singular confession and a plural confession, all right? And so we hold fast to that confession on a singular level, as a group level, and it says, since we have a great high priest who passed through the heavens. Notice the heavens is plural. Why? Because it is the teaching of Scripture that there are three heavens, okay? Now, the Jewish audience, they would have seen this and go, yeah, we got it, heavens, plural. The Gentiles, not so much. The Hebrew teaching, the Jewish teaching, okay, from the Old Testament, the first heavens is the atmosphere of the earth. The second heaven would be what what they considered like what we call space or outer space or the creation of space, okay? The third heaven is what we think of as heaven. Heaven where there are angels and the believers, the souls of believers and where God's throne room is. That's the third heaven. Okay, so he has heavens, plural. All right, notice this. It says we have a great high priest who passed through. What in the world is this guy talking about? What does he mean, pass through the heavens? What's he meaning? When's the last time the apostles saw Jesus? Yeah, the ascension. What form was Jesus in? Was he some sort of ethereal spirit? No, oh, he was glorified, resurrected, real physical human nature body, right? Okay? He didn't he didn't become on earth, put on flesh, die, was resurrected, and he stopped being the God man. Okay? He's in resurrected, perfect human, divine, resurrected form, glorified form. And he ascends from the Mount of Olives. Guess through what different areas? He ascends through the first heaven first, right? Then through the second portion of the heavens, the second heavens. And then ultimately he is there at the right hand of God in his throne room in the third heaven. Okay? So he is teaching on the ascension of Jesus. Also, don't miss this, on the importance of that our high priest is still in human form. A part of the covenant of redemption that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit made before creation is that the Son covenanted or promised, those whom the Father gives me, okay, I will put on flesh, and I will remain in human flesh. I will be their mediator. I will be their high priest For whom you give me. And I will remain in that state for how long? Forever. Because our high priest is continually making mediation for us, how long is your salvation good for? Forever. Okay? So you and I do not secure our salvation. We do not keep our salvation. We don't keep our salvation in the future. It is secured for us by the God-man, 
by the high priest, by the Messiah Jesus, in this glorified form. Does that make sense? Okay. Again, this was extremely important because in the first and second century, you had some bad doctrine that was coming into the church saying, physical is bad, spiritual is good. Physical is bad, ethereal is better. And in fact, Jesus really wasn't in flesh. He was, this, he was the Son of God, but He was in this spirit form. Okay? And He just kind of floated around and taught the disciples. And then ultimately, He went to the cross, but He didn't really die because He was in spirit form. Okay? This was tracking through all of the new church, this horrible, bad doctrine. Okay? And you can see in, in 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, he's dealing with this bad teaching. The author here is dealing with the same thing. Jesus is the Son of God. He is the God-man. He is in flesh. He is risen and glorified in the flesh and remains the God-man forever. That also speaks to how bad and sinful you and I are. Okay? Your fallenness, your sinfulness, my sinfulness is so bad that it takes the Son of God to covenant to put on flesh forever to secure our salvation forever. Follow me? Okay? It must happen that way. Martha. Yes, but what were you before? Well, sinner. Right, a sinner, correct? You will be in a glorified form, all right? You will be without sin in your mind, without sin in your body. But remember, are you guilty of sin or were you guilty of sin in the past? Okay, this is, this is where it gets, you got to have your, your soteriology, okay, your hermatology, your understanding of sin. Sin may be temporary. When you tell a lie, it's temporary, correct? Most of them are. Some go ongoing. But temporary sin against an eternal God needs an eternal answer. Does that make sense? Okay? Put it another way. Lost people who die outside of Christ. Alright? And they have had temporary sins in their lives. How long will they be under the wrath of God in the lake of fire? Forever. Well, I don't understand. If they have temporary sin, and why are they punished forever? Because that temporary sin was against an eternal God. Okay? So, though we are uh, glorified and without sin in, in these uh, raptured, resurrected bodies, the sin we did in the past still is carried and paid for forever by our high priest. That's why. Okay? Good question. I saw another hand somewhere. Okay. So, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. All right. When did this happen? When did this happen? When did this great high priest, when did he learn, or if you will, walk through this sympathizing with our weaknesses, and when was this temptation happening? Yeah, we know the, the famous biblical example of after his baptism, he, it says he is led into the wilderness where he's fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. And there, lo and behold, Satan comes to Jesus and does what? Tempts him, truly tempts him. Now, just because God has revealed those specific temptations to us in the wilderness, that does not mean that is the only temptation that Christ lived through. 
Okay, we know this because even when Jesus comes to the Garden of Gethsemane at the end of his ministry, and he's praying and he's sweating blood, right? What does he pray to the Father? Do you remember? Yeah. Lord, if it is your will, take this cup from me, but not my will. Your will be done. Okay, he knew. He knew he was going to have the sins of his people placed upon him. He knew he was going to take the wrath of his father upon the cross. He knew there was going to be this schism, if you will, between the Trinity as he, he bore the sin and the sinfulness and the punishment and the wrath of his people upon the cross. He knew that was going to happen, and yet the temptation was there. Did he sin? Did he falter? Never. Okay? But it doesn't mean that he wasn't tempted because he truly was human. He truly was the God-man. So, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. This was asked of me a couple of weeks ago. Well, maybe last week. Okay, I understand that Jesus was tempted, but could he have actually sinned if he wanted to? Okay, excellent. That's the answer. No. Okay. Why is that? Yeah, he only did whose will? The Father's will. This is, again, this is a, the wonderful proof, this doctrinal proof, that this is why the Messiah had to be 100% man, so that he could live under the law, understand our weaknesses, and sympathize with us as high priest. And yet at the same time, being 100% man, he is 100% divine. Okay? All right, you ready? You're, you're going to use this and you're going to sound fancy when you have conversations with other Christians. You ready? This is the doctrine of the hypostatic union of Christ. Write it down. You're going to sound fancy and smart. Okay? The hypostatic union of Christ. And I explain it, you're not going to feel that smart, okay? Hypostatic. Okay, how many of you have ever done this? You take a balloon, you take another balloon. You rub it on your hair, you put them together. What happens? Sticks together. Okay, that, that's hypostatic. That's all that means, okay? This is just a fancy way of saying that the God-man Jesus is 100% God, 100% human, both are true, at the same time. They're like two balloons sticking together. Okay? One balloon was not deflated and dismissed because he became man. He didn't stop being God. Okay? At the same time, okay, he is God. He didn't stop being man. Both are perfectly existing at the same time. Question. Well, I'll say this. Christ as the Son of God is the second person of the Trinity. And the Trinity has always existed. Father, Son, and Spirit. Correct? Okay? So when He comes in the flesh, when He comes to be incarnate and born into this world, nothing is subtracted. Okay? He didn't stop being the Son of God, but the Son of God added to himself human nature. So he had the two balloons, the human nature and the God nature. They did not cancel each other out. Okay? But both are true and will always be true with the Son of God. Make sense? Um... He is indwelt with the Holy Spirit because He is human, but He is also one with the Holy Spirit because He is divine. Okay? Again, this is why it's such a big deal of what Jesus did on the cross. On the cross, He takes the sins of His people. Okay? Their individual sins, their sinful natures, past, present, and future. He takes that sinfulness upon himself upon the cross. Now we have a problem. We have the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, 
and sin is upon him. Why is that a problem? Yeah, because the Holy Spirit and God the Father cannot be in the presence of sin, can they? So a part of the suffering that Jesus goes through for his people on the cross is the fact that, if you will, there's this turning of the Father and Spirit from the Son for that moment upon the cross. And then Jesus, what does he cry out? You remember? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why? Why does he cry out? Because he's sinned. He's the sins of his people at that moment on that cross. Again, this is how bad you and I are. Okay, As sinners, it literally takes this divine schism for a moment in time between Father, Son, and Spirit to secure salvation for you and I. That's how bad of sinners we are. Okay? And yet the Son of God willingly, lovingly did so. Okay? So when it comes to the question of was he the first real human to be indwelt with this Holy Spirit in this way? Um, I don't have a verse that would say that, but I say it's a close connection to the fact that his resurrected body is the resurrected body that we will share in. Okay? As a believer, the Holy Spirit has come upon you and has saved you in Jesus by the plan of the Father. Will that Spirit ever leave you? No. No. Will it leave you even in the eternity future, in the new heavens and new earth? Will that Holy Spirit leave you? No. No. Now think about this. That's true for the, the bride of Christ, for the church. Was that true for Old Testament believers? No. It wasn't true. The Holy Spirit in that office, in that situation, in that Old Covenant, could come upon a person, be with that person for a while, and then what? Leave. Leave. Happened to as greats as King Saul and King David, uh, Elijah and others, the Bible teaches. But again, one of the wonderful blessings of being in Christ is that you are permanently indwelt with the Holy Spirit. Okay? Good question. Excellent question. So on the other hand, Martha. Uh, I know that, that Jesus was tempted and he, he was sinless. Okay. We as humans are tempted. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then Jesus said that if we are angry, it, it's the same as murdering somebody. Right. It's the same. Right. If we lust after someone, it's guilty is yep. That's guilty. Okay, that's a sin. Sure. So why? I guess I don't understand why our temptations are considered sin when Jesus was. Oh, 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 okay. Temptation and sin are two separate things. Okay, can you be tempt as a believer? Can you be tempted with sin and not sin? Yeah. You are enabled by the Spirit to do so. Lost people don't have that ability. Okay? As a Christian, the temptation itself is not a sin. The temptation of Jesus in that wilderness with Satan, the temptation itself was not a sin. Okay? All right? Following, following through in those thoughts and those actions would be sin. However, however... It is true. Jesus says, you have heard it said of those of old, those who, um, uh, thou shalt not murder. Right? And we go, okay, well, good, I'm not a murderer. And then you hear the Messiah say, but if you have anger or hatred toward, in your heart towards another, you are guilty of what? Murder. Okay, I guess I am one. All right. Same thing with lust and all this. So you have to understand, um, Jesus did not, because he is God and man, could not sin. Temptation is not the sin. You and I not only can be tempted, but oftentimes we both sin in thought and in deed. Not true of Jesus. Okay, Okay? that's the difference. Temptation and sin, two separate things. Good question, though. All right. 
for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things, and all things, that's all type of things. That's pause, P-A-S. All types of things. Okay? All types of sins, as we are. Yet, he was without sin. All right? So therefore, because that is true, because it is true that he is our high priest, a sympathetic high priest, a holy, sinless high priest, therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So again, we never rest upon our own works. We never rest upon our own understandings or our own plans. Okay? This Christian life, we draw near with confidence if it is true that we are a believer, we have this high priest, we can now approach the throne of God. Not because of our own works, not because of our own righteousness, not because of our own holiness that we somehow created, but because of the righteousness and holiness that has been gifted to us in Christ, you can boldly go to the Father in prayer. And I would argue in the future rest that he talks about in this millennial kingdom and the new heavens and new earth, you can be in the presence of Father, Son, and Spirit and be okay. And you will be fine. And you will find confidence. I'm sorry, you will find grace. And you will find mercy. You will find help in the time of need. So as we live this life, and we know there will be struggles, we know that there will be temptations, we know there will be low points and valleys in our life, we are not to go to our, our inner strength, we are not to go to our inner thoughts to get us by, we are to draw near to Christ Himself as if we are before the throne of God, and we have confidence that we belong there because Christ has made it available to us. This goes back into the Gospels again. At the moment of Jesus giving up His Spirit, if you remember, it's recorded. What split into two? The veil. Yeah, the veil that separated the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was, with those from the outside. Because He was the perfect sacrifice, you now, as a believer in Christ, have direct access to the Father. You no longer go through human priests. Okay? Which, again, that's the biblical teaching, that's the biblical understanding, which is why if there is a religion out there that says you must go through a priest to get to God, we have issues, don't we? Okay? That would be an unbiblical teaching. You have a high priest. It is not another human being. It is not a part of your parish or anything like that. It is Jesus Christ Himself, our mediator. Okay? All right. Questions on chapter 4? All right. Chapter 5. Here we go. Let's read... Um, it's a short, short chapter. Let's read all 14 verses here. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men and things pertaining to God in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided since he himself also is beset with weakness. And because of it, he is obligated to offer, offer sacrifices for sins as for the people, so also for himself. And no one takes the honor to himself but receives it when he is called by God, even as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself as to, so as high to become a high priest, but he who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Just as he says also in another passage, You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his piety. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, 
He became to all those who obey Him the source of eternal salvation, being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Concerning Him we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, and because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. All right. Walk through this here. Okay, here in verse 1. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of things, on behalf of men in things pertaining to God. This is simply going back to the Old Testament, okay, as taught in the books of Exodus and Leviticus. Okay, uh, the readers of this letter, the Hebrew uh, believers, would have been very familiar with this portion of the whole Levitical priestly system. You couldn't just say, well, I'm a priest today. It didn't work that way. You had to be appointed. All right. So he says, for every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men in things pertaining to God in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. The readers would have, again, understood that this was how God had instituted this role of priest. They had to be appointed. They had to be Levites. And this was a very special office, if you will, because they did work inside the temple with gifts and sacrifices for sins. Okay. Now, in the backdrop of this, the readers would have associated the very corrupt and evil system of high priest that they lived through. Okay. Because at this point, for several generations, the Romans had been in charge of the nation of Israel, and basically they had this high priest in this puppet format of the Romans would actually choose the high priest for that given year for the nation of Israel. They were not following the law. Okay, They were breaking the Mosaic law and it became a political position. It became the de facto leader of the Sanhedrin and of the nation of Israel. And it really was just uh, an individual chosen by the Romans to serve in this capacity. So the readers of this, they would have seen the corruption. They knew that it was a political figure. They knew it was not something that was healthy, but sinful. So they're comparing that life experience of these corrupted high priests, and now they're comparing it again to the perfect high priest that is the Messiah Jesus. Okay? So for every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men and things pertaining to God in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided since he himself also is beset with weakness. Okay, now, I know you don't like being insulted. I don't like being insulted. But technically, the Bible just called us what in verse 2? Ignorant and misguided. Okay, all right. This is why we need the Word of God. This is why we are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. Because by default, we are ignorant and misguided. But look, how does Jesus, how does He deal with us in verse 2? Gently. Now this word gently, okay, uh, this is uh, pytho, P-E-I-T-H-O. P-E-I-T-H or E-O, or O, okay? With compassion, with meekness, with gentleness, with mildness. And it was used often as a mom or dad dealing with a young child. A young child who is ignorant, a young child who is doing wrong, okay? But they are ignorant and misguided. Right? You understand this if you have ever dealt with a 
two, three, four-year-old, could they be described as maybe ignorant and misguided? Yes. And yet they want what they want, don't they? This is what we're going through with Dylan at home. Okay? So, be humble in this. Okay? Even the most uh, holy and righteous and studious and biblical scholars are, and, and spirit-led Christian, in general, when compared to the Lord, we are ignorant and misguided. Okay? So he deals with us gently as if he's dealing with a small child. And he does this, again, because he put on human flesh, he is our high priest, and he himself also is beset with weakness. He knew, because of that perfect life that he lived under the law, he knew what it was to be hungry, thirsty, tired, worn down, he was, a, a, as Isaiah 53 talks about, he was acquainted with sorrows. He knew what it meant to be, if you will, depressed and lowly, to be persecuted. Okay? He could sympathize with all of those weaknesses that we deal with. Okay? And he deals with us in a gentle manner. And because of it, he is obligated to offer sacrifices for sins as for the people, so also for himself. Okay? So we know this. The high priests in the Old Testament, they couldn't just walk into the temple and start sacrificing lambs and goats and all these pigeons and all that stuff. They couldn't just walk in and do that. What did they have to do first? Yeah, they had to have, they have this sacrificial system for themselves, if you will, to be covered by that blood, okay? And then they would be able to go in and offer sacrifices for the Israelites and for the nation, okay? We have this high priest. He is without sin, okay? But because he has taken upon himself a human nature... And he was tempted. Okay? He is our high priest. And it says, look there, notice this. Because of it, it says he is obligated to offer sacrifices for sins. That word obligated. Under covenant. Okay? Under covenant. This is what the Son of God covenanted or promised to do. Okay, this goes again back to the covenant of redemption before creation. The Father would choose, he, he chose to create. Okay, he did it through the Son, empowered by the Holy Spirit, creation itself. It says the Father, again, choosing a people to give to his Son. The Son covenants with the Father and the Holy Spirit. I will take these people that the Father gives, gives me. I will put on flesh. I will be their high priest. And it says, He is obligated to offer sacrifice for sin. Under covenant or under promise. It's not that He wouldn't do this, it's that he has already covenanted that he will do this. And he will do this forever as a perfect high priest. Because of it, he is obligated to offer sacrifices for sins as for the people. So also for himself. And no one takes the honor to himself, but receives it when he is called by God even as Aaron was. Now this is, don't miss this in verse 4, because it's speaking about us, if you're a believer. So just as the Son was sent by the Father, just as the Son is under this covenant promise that He will bring an end to the sins of His people, He will be the sacrifice for His people, okay? We will partake in that salvation, we are of his people as believers. Okay? But notice this. Read verse 4 carefully. No one 
takes the honor to himself. If you are in Christ, if Christ is your high priest, if he is your mediator and you possess salvation, you are not to take what upon yourself? Honor. Notice that word honor. Okay? Time, T I M E E. Do not take esteem or credit. If you possess salvation and he is your high priest and he is your mediator, you are not to take what? Honor, credit, or esteem upon yourself. But notice, but receives it when he is what? Called by who? God. Even as Aaron was. As Aaron was called to be a priest, notice as believers, we are a nation of priests. We are called to this position. The salvation, this realm of having a high priest, this blessing of having the Messiah as a high priest, this blessing of being a part of the bride, of being this holy nation as Peter calls us, no one takes the honor to himself. Don't you dare take credit or esteem or honor for your salvation. Because it is received when what? Called by God. Well, this sounds different than the American gospel, doesn't it? The American gospel tells you to do what? Call upon God, He'll react, and He'll save you. And really, He's kind of lucky to have you. This is awesome that you've figured all this out and you want to be saved. Is that what that verse is teaching? This verse is teaching the exact opposite. If Jesus is your high priest, he's your mediator, and you possess salvation, you didn't do that. So don't you dare take honor in that. It says you received it when you were called by God. So who's doing the calling? God is. He's calling you out of darkness into light. He is calling you out of your sin into life, into eternal life in his Son. This is why, again, both in Job and the book of Psalms, it says salvation is of the Lord, not of you or I. Okay? So be careful. No one takes the honor to himself, but receives it when he is called by God, even as Aaron was when he was called out of his sin to be high priest. Question? Yep? When it says call, you know, I also have to understand God chooses who he calls. It's not an open invitation to whoever says, Well, I'll pull back. I'll accept it. <laughs> You're not the activator of this, are you? No. No. God is sovereign in all things. Okay? So I say this to be very careful. You, the Christian, me as the Christian. When the Lord gives us the opportunity to share the gospel with others and even to share our testimony, be very careful how you share that testimony. Okay? Most of the time, what is the very first word of our testimony? I. I. And then we follow along with various sentences that we were taught. I uh, made Jesus Lord of my life. Or I accepted Him in my heart. Or I made Him my Lord and Savior. Do you see why that's a problem in verse 4? Okay? And your testimony, be biblical. The Lord saved me. The Lord called me out of darkness. The Lord showed me my sin and my sinfulness. And the Lord saved me. Do you see how automatically that sounds more biblical than how we usually say it? Okay? So understand verse 4. Do not take credit... Do not take honor. Do not take esteem. Even as something as personal 
as your own salvation, don't you dare take honor or credit in it. Okay? Does that make sense? All right. I'll stop there. We'll pick it up in verse 5 starting next week. Okay? Father, I thank you for this morning. Again, I thank you for the clarity of Scripture. Truly, your word is sharp. Lord, it shows our sin. It shows the truth of who we are. And at the same time, Lord, it shows the truth of who you are in your grace and in your mercy, in your perfection. Lord, that salvation is found in you and only in you. Lord, forgive us when we are puffed up and even take credit, honor, and esteem for the salvation that we possess. Forgive us when we do that. Lord, help us to remember to always honor and esteem you in our salvation, in our walk, and in our life, Lord. So we thank you, and we love you, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you now. Verse 5 next week.